with the Spirit of God dwelling in his fullness in my heart, because of sanctifying me wholly through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what can I expect now? What is this life like? Do I go on sinning in thought, word, and deed every day of my life? Good morning and welcome to God's Resistance. Thank you for tuning in to God's Resistance, where we resist sin, self, the devil, and the world. You can hear us every Sunday at 9 a.m. on WITK 1550 a.m. and 94.7 FM. I just want to let you know that we're local. We're in the Wyoming Valley, Wilkes-Barre area. We're looking to start small groups to talk about spiritual matters and to look at the Bible together. We're trying to be disciples ourselves, and we want to make disciples of Jesus Christ. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance, that is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. Make sure to like and follow us for video content, teaching, and preaching. You can find us on YouTube as well. Be sure to subscribe and turn on the bell to be notified of any new videos. Please also look for God's Resistance podcast on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to have a Bible study, if you'd like to pray with somebody, you'd like to talk with somebody, then I'm asking you to please contact us. You can contact me at gods.resistance at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 570-362-7782. Now let's listen in on today's briefing. Last week we talked about the indwelling Spirit of God, that everybody that's saved has the Spirit of God in them, but not everybody that's saved has the fullness of the Spirit of God in them. So after one is filled with the Spirit, after one is sanctified, holy, receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they now have the fullness of His Spirit. But what else are the results of this fullness of the Spirit? One aspect I'd like to bring up is a cleansed heart. That is a result of the Spirit dwelling within our hearts in His fullness. And I want to start with Acts 15, verse 8, which reads, And God which knoweth the hearts, beareth them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. What is the context of this verse? That's going to be king. Context is king. Well, here, Peter is at the Jerusalem council, and he's reiterating to the Jerusalem council, the Pentecost that he just witnessed in Cornelius, the Gentile soldier's house. And so he is telling them, God, who knows the hearts, bear those Gentiles witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and he's speaking about the day of Pentecost, and he put no difference between us, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. This verse tells us two things. That first, On the day of Pentecost, where the disciples were waiting in the upper room, they received a pure heart. Their hearts were purified by faith. That was Peter's declaration and testimony. The second thing is, is he says, the same thing happened to Cornelius and his household. So the question then is, were the disciples saved before Pentecost? I believe that I have dealt with some of this in some previous broadcasts, but for our context right now, these things need to be brought up again. Were the disciples saved before Pentecost? Do Let me ask you this question. Do we train sinners to go out and, and preach repentance and to preach the gospel? Did Jesus train sinners to do that? Jesus said that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven if you are not born again, John 3, verses 3 and 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, we read, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. 
So if Jesus said that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven except you be born again, and then the testimony in Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, from the days of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist started his ministry out in the public, from those days until the present day where Jesus was speaking to people that were in front of him, he said the heaven, uh, that heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. That means people were entering the kingdom of God, and by Jesus' own words, that means these people had to have been born again. Therefore, we can safely deduce that the apostles were saved before the day of Pentecost. Another very clear testimony, we find that the disciples' names were written in heaven. Even those that would oppose a second work of grace have their founder, John Calvin, commenting on Luke 10:20, stating that the disciples were saved before Pentecost. He said this, he might, Jesus might indeed have commanded the disciples to rejoice that they had been regenerated by the Spirit of God and become new creatures in Christ, that they have been enlightened in the hope of salvation and had received the earnest of the inheritance. So even John Calvin would have recognized that they were saved people while Jesus was walking on the earth. Jesus said that the disciples were clean before Pentecost. Also, if we look in John 13, verse 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. So he said that there were some people that were there who were clean, some people that were saved that were right there. And he said, not all, speaking of Judas. So again, were the disciples saved before Pentecost? I believe with these verses, we can say yes. What do we learn here about this cleansing? That it is after one is saved, because Peter referenced the day of Pentecost and said, especially them, their hearts were purified by faith. And then later in the house of Cornelius, the same thing happened to them and their hearts were purified by faith. So there was a cleansing that took place after people were saved. And that cleansing is possible because if it happened to Peter, who is a Jew, and then it happened to the Gentiles in Cornelius' house, then it can happen to anybody if they meet the same conditions. So it not only is it possible, but it's also universal. It's not just for those glory days of the early church, but Jesus said he told us these promises so that those that believed on the words of the apostles may experience the same things the apostles had experienced, which is a pure heart, a holy heart, purified by faith. And I'm not just talking about trying to experience some crazy manifestations. The Bible is the most sane book you can read. God is not going to baptize someone in the Holy Ghost and make them a fool. God is going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost so that they have a holy heart and they have the power of God to do God's work. When the disciples were baptized with the Holy Ghost, their hearts were made pure. Their hearts were cleansed. 2 Chronicles 29.18, we read this. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, we have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. So here's another question. Does the Old Testament teach the importance of cleansing and purity? Over and over again in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Leviticus, you can find that there was repeated references to cleansing, cleansing so many different things. Everything in the temple was pure. Pots, pans, snuff dishes, candlesticks, gold, incense, the places they eat, the table, the priests, the sacrifices, the miters on their head, the hats on their head, all of it had to be clean. And there is a word that is in the Hebrew called tehor, which is used 95 times in the Old Testament, which means to clean, to make pure, and this word's used 95 times. It's used about lepers, they were to be clean, about heifers or cows, the sacrifices, they were to be clean, garments after they were contaminated, they were to be clean. 95 times that word was used in the Old Testament. Another word, which also means to cleanse, to purge, to purify, was used 94 times in the Old Testament. When the Holy Ghost comes in and you are filled with the Spirit, 
It is not just an anointing of power, but there is a purifying from which comes power to live a holy life and to serve God acceptably. You know, many people want the power without the purity. Many people want happiness without holiness. But God is not going to give you his power, and God is not going to give you that deep joy of the soul without a pure heart, because those things are the result of a pure heart. I've talked with many people before. I, t- I spoke with somebody on the street not too long back, and I, they, they believe that they're called of God to do something, and I have no doubt that they were. But I did say to them, would you give a three-year-old a machete? And the obvious answer was no. If you gave a three-year-old a machete, you'd back up. You'd want to get as far away from that little kid because you don't trust that little kid to know how to use that thing and wield it properly. It's the same thing with God. He's not going to fill us with this wonderful divine power if we don't have a pure heart, if we're not equipped to use the power of God in the right way, if we're going to use it on ourselves and we're going to get the glory to ourselves and not to God, God's not going to give us that power. He wants to purify our hearts to make us holy evangels of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 23, 26, Jesus said, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So what's Jesus conveying when he spoke to the Pharisees like this? What is the the inference that the inner heart of a person can be cleansed and must be cleansed? The Pharisees knew how to clean up the outside and make themselves wear their religious garb and try and make themselves look like they're the cream of the crop, religiously speaking, that if, if anybody had any question as to what holiness looked like, it was definitely them. That was what they portrayed, but Jesus saw through it. He said, you can clean up the outside, but the inside's, the inside's still dirty. He said, if you clean the inside of a plate or a bowl and you clean a platter, well, isn't the outside clean also? You can use it now. And that's exactly what God wants to do with us. He wants to use us, but he's got to clean us. Jesus was showing that it was not only no outward sin, but no inward sin. Therefore, showing Jesus has an expectation for a cleansed heart and a holy heart, and that it is possible. Let's look in 1 John, the first chapter and the ninth verse. If we confess our sins... He, that is Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. So what is said here about Jesus' desire for us? He himself wants to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is said here about Jesus' power? He's able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have, in fact, a promise here, a certainty that he will, in fact, do this if we meet the conditions. If we confess our sins, then he, Jesus, is faithful, so we can trust in him. He's reliable and just to forgive us our sins. Well, if he didn't have the power to do that, why on earth would God ever promise that to us? But he promised it because he does have the power and he is able to cleanse us from all sin. What is said here of the result of of his power upon sin? He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The way people talk in present Christianity is he'll clean us from some or most of it, but not all of it. But when you look in the scripture, it is all inclusive. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all of it, not some, but all. And may God help us to believe him instead of men. Ephesians 5, 25, we read, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What's Jesus looking for, according to these verses? He's looking for a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. blemish. Does that sound like Jesus is coming back for a sinful church? Does that sound like Jesus is coming back for people that got their ticket punched but still live just the same as they ever did before they met Christ? I don't think that that's what the Bible's speaking about. How is he going to secure then that pure and holy church? He said he's going to do it that he might sanctify and cleanse it. God gave his only begotten son for the world 
that he might save the world, but Jesus Christ gave himself that he might sanctify and cleanse the church and make the church holy. Through what means is he going to do this? Through the washing of water by the word, through the medium of his inspired revelation, namely the word of God. In case you've just tuned in, you are listening to God's Resistance, where we resist sin, self, the world, and the devil. You can hear us every Sunday at 9 a.m. on WITK, 1550 a.m. and 94.7 FM. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance. That is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. You can also email us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or call us at 570-362-7782. In Ezekiel 36, 25, we read, Then, and this is God speaking, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. How many times does it say all there? Jesus died to give his church or believers a clean heart. We just read about that. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light, that is believers, if we walk in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from some sin. That's not what it says, though. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. What does Jesus' blood do? cleanseth us from all sin. Not only does it do it, at, does his blood cleanse in a moment, but it continually cleanses from all sin so we can live a pure and a holy life. Is there any room then for the thought of the suppression of the sin nature? Is there any room that God is just going to kind of you know, we, the kind of Christian life we have to live is one where he just kind of pushes it down. We feel all this murkiness and this, this indwelling sin within, and he's going to push it down. There was a, a man who had explained it this way. He was saying that we have to think of salvation like this. We got saved, and we do have a new life, but then also there's this struggle going on between the flesh and the spirit that's happening. And he said it this way. That, think of it like two different horses a black horse and a white horse. The black horse is that horse, or it, it represents that indwelling sin, that inbred sin. And so he said, and the white horse, that represents our new life. And he said, so here's what you need to do. You need to feed the white horse more than the black horse. I heard a preacher say once, he said, I was listening to this man say this on the radio, and I wanted to call in and say, stop feeding the black horse altogether. Let the black horse die. Better yet, break his neck. And that is exactly what God wants to do to inbred sin. He wants to burn out the chaff with unquenchable fire of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and make us holy. There is no thought or room for suppression of the sin nature. The only thing that you and I have to suppress is humanity, our, our good and right normal human desires that could lead us astray if we're not careful. But the nature of sin, God wants to cleanse from our hearts. Because we've given God everything then, there's no dark corner of the soul that we do not allow God's light to shine on. Therefore, that complete openness allows all things to be manifest. And if all things are manifest, then light fills your heart and fills my heart. In God, there's no darkness at all. Therefore, where God is, there is no evil. In other words, there's a clean heart if God's dwelling inside of us in his fullness. 1 Timothy 1.5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. I just want to say something just for a moment. What does pure mean? If we were looking for a pure diamond, and we, oh, we, we look at it under a microscope, and we see that there's imperfections there, but you paid the price for a pure diamond, I think you wouldn't be too happy about that. You would say, well, this isn't 100% pure. I don't want it. So when God says pure, does he mean anything different? I don't think he does. Otherwise, why would he speak these words? So what did Jesus say that all the law and the prophets hung on? Wasn't it to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself? So how do we fulfill the law of love according to that verse? 
It is the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart. Pure heart is the wellspring of this love for God and man. It is by a good conscience, and it is by faith unfeigned. What does unfeigned mean? Unfeigned means genuine. He wants us to have a good conscience and genuine faith. So the whole point of the commandment of God is that you have a pure heart that contains love, a good conscience, and real genuine faith. Psalm 24, 3, we read, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So what are the questions that are asked? Who will dwell in the presence of the Lord God Almighty? What are clean hands? That's the next question. He said, the, those that have clean hands and a pure heart, but what are clean hands? No active sin. Our sins are forgiven. I'm not committing sins with my hands anymore. I'm not doing actions of sin. What is a pure heart? a heart that is free from indwelling sin, a heart that is free from the tyrant that is inside of our heart, where the sin has no more, the sin has no more dominion over you because we have been crucified with Christ and have experienced the destruction of the body of sin. So the heights of all religion must start with a pure heart where there is no willful sin. You can live that way, listener. You can live that way. The Bible says so. 1 Peter 1, 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So can you fervently love your brothers and sisters in Christ without a pure heart? According to this verse, no. So we need to have a heart purified unto genuine love of the brethren, of those that are also saved. And we need to love with a pure heart. So now that you already have a pure heart, this verse is saying, fervent love is to be your pursuit, and it can be. But first, there must be a pure heart. Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Who is blessed here? Those with pure hearts. Is God mocking us then? Can we really have a pure heart? Purity of heart gives us the open vision to see God as he is. You know, dirty glasses can distort your vision. There was this story told of a lady, uh, the husband and a wife, a lady sitting at her breakfast table every morning. She's looking out her window and she sees her neighbor's house. And every morning she complains to her husband. She says, oh, look at their house. It's so filthy. I wish they would just clean that place, you know? They're right next to us. Every morning I sit down for breakfast, I look out this window and I see how filthy this house is. I wish they would just clean that house. Day after day, she would say this at the breakfast table. Well, one day she gets up, she sits down. She's about to go through the same complaining. And she looks out the window and suddenly it's clean. And the wife tells her husband, Look at how the neighbors have shaped up. They went ahead and cleaned their house. Finally, that was her attitude. But the husband's reply was, well, they didn't clean up the house. I went out and washed the windows of our house. And that is what this verse is talking about. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They're going to be the ones that see God. Your heart is the eye with which you see God. If the heart is clean, then you can see God clearly. Mark 8, 22 through 25. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. Mark 8, uh, excuse me, and then the 23rd verse. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, Jesus put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Seems to be somewhat of a type of that second crisis experience that a Christian would come to. God wants to purify our hearts so we can see him properly, so we can see people properly. 
You know, another place Jesus said, how can you take the little speck out of someone else's eye when you have a giant beam in your own? The giant beam in your own is the deceitful heart that needs to be slain by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If that is slain out of the heart and I have a pure heart, then I can see God. I asked just a little while ago, is God mocking us? Can we really have a pure heart? By the way that you would hear a lot of present-day evangelicalism talk about the Christian life, you would think that that is what's going on, that God is in fact mocking us. In fact, he is insulting our intelligence in so many ways because he uses words that he doesn't mean. And so then we have to try and figure out what he really means. God doesn't play around with us like that, though. If you're listening to this, realize it's a possibility. God's not going to ask of us to have a clean heart and to put it out in front of us in so many different ways through the Old Testament in types, and then in clear statements we can see out of the words, out of the mouth of Jesus, out of his apostles, we can see it in an example in people's lives. We can see the testimony of Peter where he said he had his heart purified by faith in the day of Pentecost. God is not going to make us do all these mental gymnastics so that we then can maybe figure out what God is saying in code. No, God wants us to understand. He wants us to understand so that we obtain that clean heart. God will not mock us, but to any believing and simple soul that will see what God says in his word and take him at his word, meet his conditions and believe him, you can see that all things are possible with God. So listening to this, I don't know what your background is. You know, maybe you've gone to church for some years. Maybe you've gone to church all your life. You've read all there is to read about Christianity. Maybe you you feel like you've been struggling with an unclean heart, and you know you've been saved. You know God's done something for you. You have a measure of victory over sin. You've been walking for it in your life, but there's just there's a clog in the pipes. If that's where you are. I just want to encourage you as you're listening. You can have your heart cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He will sanctify you wholly. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. It'll be the most satisfying experience that you will ever have. It'll be the most satisfying Christian life that you will have. A spiritual depth will be inside of your soul that you did not have before. Or you can stand back and you can listen to the naysayers that tell you it's not possible. But I just want to tell you it is possible. The Lord had helped me after I got saved and showed me the ugliness of my own heart. And I sought God and I laid everything on the altar. And he was very specific with me about things inside of my life and heart that he wanted to take care of. And he pointed his finger on some things. There were ambitions that I had in life. And he said, do you want those ambitions or do you want me? And I had to come out on the yes side of those things. I was in a relationship or I wanted to be in a relationship with somebody and I wanted them to be saved so that we could get married. But God said, that is the wrong motive. You want them to be saved so you can get married and that'll never work. And he just peeled me apart like an onion and pointed these certain things. My reputation, all sorts of questions came before me, and I had to lay it all down on the altar of God until I came to the place where I realized I gave him everything. And I just want to tell you, listener, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Do not listen to the naysayers, but submerge yourself into the word of God, plunge in, launch out into the deep, believe God, believe his promises, seek his face, and receive the holy heart that he wants to give you, the cleansed heart, and you can have it with the fullness of his spirit. Please tune in next Sunday at 9 a.m. If you'd like a copy of this broadcast, please look for God's Resistance on your favorite podcasting platform. Look for us on Facebook and Twitter at God's Resistance. That is G-O-D-S-R-E-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. Make sure to like and follow us for teaching, preaching, and video content. You can find us on YouTube as well. Be sure to subscribe and turn on the bell to be notified of any new videos. If you need someone to talk to, if you want someone to pray with you, then please email us at gods.resistance at gmail.com or call us at 570-362-7782. And I want to let you know, if you email or you call, you'll be speaking with me directly. You're not going to be speaking with somebody that you, know, you haven't heard or don't know. You'll be speaking with me. Join the resistance. God's resistance. <laughs>
A special thank you to Spectacular Sound Productions for giving permission for the use of the song Heroes and Monsters, which was edited and used in part on this production. The permission was granted under Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. That license may be found at https colon forward slash forward slash creative commons dot org forward slash licenses forward slash by hyphen essay forward slash 4.0 forward slash legal code.